Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In our own time and culture, we often contrast various motivations for loving, and we can talk about people being superficial lovers just of appearances, looking for people who are physically attractive, and counterpoise that to a whole bunch of other things that you know we, we put into a sort of grab bag of what's different, like somebody having a great personality or loving them for their mind or caring about the real person. Oftentimes we'll contrast the two as if it's body and what is not body that is the dividing line. In Pausanias's speech, it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, he's going to distinguish two very different, distinct ways of loving, two different types of love, in fact. He's also going to bind it up with um, concerns about, um, you know, male-male sexual relation, relations as opposed to male-female sexual relations. He doesn't really have anything to say about women uh, being involved with other women. Um, which might be a bit of an oversight in his speech. But let's see what, how he unpacks this notion of there being two different kinds of loves. This is in part what he criticizes the previous speech, Phaedrus um, was the giver of that, for not having adequately distinguished. We saw that Phaedrus says, love brings out the best in everybody. Pausanias is saying, eh, it brings out the best in some people, but in other people it doesn't do you know, that. It may actually bring out the worst in them. So he's going to contrast what he calls the heavenly or Uranian Aphrodite against the earthly or pandemic Aphrodite. And he's, these are uh, two goddesses, and he says, look, you know, the goddess Aphrodite is not just one, there's actually two. One uh, origin story of Aphrodite has her, in fact, being generated from heaven itself, right? not having a birth like other gods or, or creatures or anything like that, but being generated by the heavens. Now, he glosses over the way that this, this happens. Uh, in the story, Uranos, who's the, the, one of these primal beings that means sky, he is the father of the titans. And one of the titans, Kronos, will actually end up taking power, and he'll do that in part by castrating Uranos, and then taking what he's cut off and throwing it into the ocean. And out of that, Aphrodite comes, you know, there's that famous uh, painting that you've probably seen before of Aphrodite arising from the waves. That's what she's arising from. But you can still say, well, look, there's no birth there, ancient goddess. Okay, we, we get that, right? Then we have uh, another goddess, another Aphrodite, because the Greeks were often rather confused about these origin stories, or often more than one who is the daughter of Zeus, as are many of the gods, right? And Dione, and Zeus gets together the way he typically does, screwing around on his wife, by the way, with uh, Dione. And um, boom, there you get another little godlet who becomes a god in, in her own right. So um, part of what Pausanias is going to draw from this is that this uh, goddess, the, the pandemic the common, the vulgar Aphrodite, is partaking equally in the male and the female. And for Pausanias, the female is something lower, something uh, not quite as good, something that um, is, is not filled with intellect the way the male is. The heavenly Aphrodite is entirely from or of the male. Um, this is, you know, maybe something questionable about it, but here I'm only interested in explaining his position. Now, what this leads to is two different kinds of love. Aphrodite is the goddess of love or sexual desire. Aphrodisia means all the actions. We tend to think of aphrodisiacs 
as um, you know, things that we would introduce into the sexual relation to try to intensify it. The Greek word aphrodisia means all the things that are connected with getting it on, with, with having sex, with pursuing somebody, with courting somebody. All of those are, are part of aphrodisia. And the um, earthly love, he says, is the love uh, that is just oriented towards the body. So you see an attractive person, uh, you know, it could be they're walking down the street, or it could be you're watching a TV show, or it could be you're, you're you know, looking at, uh, you know, magazines in, in a checkout line, or in that, that special kiosk section that they have in all these grocery stores. And, you know, the images that are put on there, usually photoshopped, right, are created specifically to arouse desire. And they don't arouse desire by saying, oh my God, look at the mind on that person. They arouse desire by, by, you know, featuring physical aspects. And this is a shape of love, right? Uh, there is love that takes place, in, you know, with just the body. And this can be oriented either towards men or towards women. Um, presumably, although Posanius doesn't really talk much about this, because he's only interested in the male perspective, we could talk about, you know, uh, women being attracted to men, and being attracted primarily to the body. Um, this is maybe a, a gap in his, his discussion, right? With the, the heavenly Aphrodite, it's not that there's no love of the body, there's no attraction to the body, but it doesn't stop just with the, the external appearance. So it's a love of the body, but also a love of the soul. And he takes this as only possible for, for men to feel towards other men, in part because he's making a whole argument that we don't need to get into about why um, you know, the, the, the good virtuous lover should be, should be allowed. And we're going to talk about that in some other videos. In any case, what's most important here is that there's, there's a love of the soul that's going on. So what, you know, what can we say is identified with the soul? Intelligence. If you love somebody for their soul, they have to have something to offer in their soul. So you can't just love somebody for their personality or for who they are or for their interior or whatever if they're a complete dirtbag or if they're stupid or if they're, you know, pick whatever else you like. Uh, this is the ancient, you know, Greek perspective that we're looking at and Pausanias is representing it. If you're going to love somebody for their soul, their soul had better have some remarkable aspects to it, like being intelligent. That's the one that he focuses on the most. Uh, nobility of character would also play a role in there as well, right? And we can contrast that to the, the common love, which is not really attracted to, to, you know, things that are deep like that. It's attracted to the superficial. Why? Because the body and how it's clothed and, you know, how it's articulated and all that sort of, that's really superficial by definition, right? It is the surface. It is not what is inside. It is what is outside. We could um, take this analysis further and say that you could be attracted to even more superficial things. You know, the Greeks distinguish between the goods of the body and external goods. So if you're really only interested in somebody because they have a lot of money or a fancy car or a nice house or a good bank account or, or something like that, then um, that could fall in here as well. But that might not even be love by Pausanias's view because there's no erotic desire there. Um, I suppose we could talk about fetishes that people have with respect to that, but that takes us far uh, beyond what he's, what he's getting at. Now, this kind of love here, it's not that it's simply bad. So to love somebody or desire them for their body in a superficial way is not necessarily bad, but it's not good either. It could, it could go towards good actions, or it could go towards bad actions. There's really no way to tell which way it's going to go. That's Pausanias' point. He's not saying it's just bad. He's saying, well, it's a you know, mixture of good and bad. Um, why is this? Because it doesn't actually understand what it's about. It's not based on knowledge. It's not based on anything intellectual. So the person who is motivated by this kind of love just sort of acts at random. They might end up doing really good things. Of course, they might end up doing really bad things as a result as well. There's no way to tell. This is one reason, too, why he says, look, you shouldn't be loving people who are, you know, not really fully developed because you don't know how they're going to turn out when they do develop, right? Now, 
Uh, by contrast, the, this, this heavenly love, it leads to only good action. Action that is right, action that is noble, action that is based on understanding what it does and desiring what is good. This is going to lead to a very important effect over time. When, we, when we're contrasting these things against each other, we haven't yet introduced the notion of you know, a lifespan. Um, the person who only loves the body, the body is something mutable. It changes over time. Of course, the soul changes over time too, or personality, whatever you want to say. But the body changes much more quickly. And if you think about the kind of beauty that's associated solely with the body, it's not very long-lasting, is it? You know, think about a face, right? You get wrinkles quite quickly. And, um, you know, we, we, we do, you know, in our society, we're a little bit um, uh, biased towards men. We let men get away with a lot more wrinkles than we do women. Um, but even so, you see a lot of guys going in for plastic surgery. Why? Precisely so that they can be attractive to this kind of love here. That's what, what Pausanias would say. Um, here. Right? Hair gets gray, gets white, falls out, you lose it, right? Um, you know, there's all sorts of other aspects to the body, too. You know, the body of a 16-year-old who's in good shape will not look like the body of a 45-year-old who's in good shape. The 45-year-old is inevitably going to be stockier, right? And that's the way it should be. But to the person who's only concerned with this, that's not going to maintain the force of desire. So what happens? Well, the basis for the relationship eventually disappears. And this is what leads to all sorts of bad behavior on people's part. You know, I, I, I'm going to, you know, love you forever. Uh, we get married. We take all these vows to each other. But it's just based on physical attractiveness. And suddenly somebody goes through a midlife crisis and now they're chasing the youths, right? The people who appear to have a, a better body, but who are probably not all that much on the ball. As a matter of fact, if they're going out with somebody who clearly is in the middle of a midlife crisis, they are probably, um, at least from this perspective, uh, oriented towards the wrong things themselves, right? By contrast, and Pausanias has himself in mind with this because he's actually a lover of Agathon. He's an older man who maintains a relationship with Agathon over the course of their lives. The lover who is motivated by the heavenly Aphrodite, by the kind of love that comes along with that, that's oriented not just towards the body, but even more towards the personality, the mind, the soul, the inner being of the person, not only is going to lead to good action and to friendship, but it's going to be a constant um, type of love. It's going to remain as people age, as people go through changes. It's going to probably grow in that case. So like I put here, the lover who loves on this basis is a constant and thus reliable lover. They're not going to throw over the person that they're involved with just because the, the new shiny model is in town. You hear people talk that way. If people talk that way, they're clearly over here on this side, right? Uh, notice what we've got here. On this side, the person is not really being treated entirely as a person. On this side, the person is being treated as a person. And, you know, the tragic part of this speech is that many people may not be capable of anything other than this pandemic Aphrodite-driven sort of love. 